Assalamu alaikum. When you hear the word slavery, what image comes to your mind? A white man forcing a colored man to do hard labor against his will, right? Then you ask your Muslim friend, is that allowed in Islam? The Muslim says, absolutely not. And then you ask another Muslim, is it allowed in Islam to buy and sell slaves? And he answers, of course yes. What? Is slavery forbidden and allowed at the same time? How is that possible? One time you hear a Muslim scholar saying, Islam abolished slavery. Another time you hear another Muslim scholar saying, it is allowed to own a slave. What's going on here? Don't worry. In this video, I will explain the whole story. And where exactly does the confusion come from? So bring your coffee and let's start. Can you imagine that the same word can mean different things to different people? For example, if you use the word slave in front of a person who was educated by Western media, the first thing that will pop into his imagination is European ships putting innocent Africans in chains and dragging them in an inhumane way to force them to work in their newly conquered land after they mass murdered their original inhabitants. So unfortunate. But if you use the same word, slave, in a Muslim environment, do you know what pops into my imagination? I will tell you. All the presidents, the ministers, and government officials of Egypt, Libya, Palestine, Arabia, Iraq, Syria, and Sudan for hundreds of years. Confused? Did you know that Muslim slaves ruled all this area in the Muslim world for hundreds of years? Did you know that a Muslim slave can be a king? Not only political leaders, by the way, even religious leaders and scholars. For example, Sheikh Ibn Sirin, he was a slave. Mujahid, he was a slave. Al Hassan al Basri, he was a slave. Even Saad ibn al Jubir, he also was a slave. I'm sure a lot of you now are more confused than before. Don't worry, I promise you, if you watch this video till the end, you will understand everything. But before I explain, we need to have some historical context first. Let's look at the Arabs before the Prophet Muhammad peace and blessing be upon him. Actually the Arabs in this time period, they were exactly like the Europeans in the colonization era. They were racists, if someone was born with a dark skin, he or she automatically becomes a slave. Or if he's very 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 lucky, a second class citizen. Slaves were also obtained by tribes invading villages and enslaving their innocent people, just like that. They learned that from the people of the book who lived in Arabia. The people of the book learned this behavior from their religious texts and they taught the Arabs to do the same. For example, in Deuteronomy chapter 20 verse from 10 to 17. When you go to attack a city, first give its people a chance to surrender. If they open their gates and surrender, they all become your slaves and do forced labor for you. But if the people in that city will not surrender but choose to fight, Surround it with your army, then when the Lord, your God, let you capture the city, kill every man in it. You may however take for yourselves the women, and the children, and the livestock, and everything else in the city, it will be yours. Of course, we don't believe this is the real Torah, this is the book they wrote with their own hands claiming it's from God. Anyway, back to the Arabs. Slaves were treated in an inhumane way. They had no rights, men were forced labor and women were forced into prostitution. It was okay for the owner to punish his slaves by whipping them or severely hurting them, sometimes taking their life if they disobey him. They also learned that from the people of the book and the people of the book got it from their claimed scripture. For example, in Exodus chapter 21 verse 20 and 21. Anyone who beats their male or female slaves with a rod must be punished if the slave dies as a direct result. But they are not to be punished if the slave recovers after a day or two, since the slave is their property. According to this verse in the scripture, it's okay to severely hurt a slave, even cause him internal bleeding, no problem. Just make sure he doesn't die in the same day. If he died after two days, it's okay, because he is your property. Subhanallah. Again, we don't believe this is what was revealed to Moses. We believe this is fabricated books that they are claiming to be the words of God. To sum up, Arabs were as bad as the Christian Europeans when their church was actually in power. 
The good news is, this slavery ended in both worlds, the Islamic world and the Western world, but it ended in completely different ways. It ended in Arabia through the teachings of Prophet Muhammad peace and blessing be upon him. And it ended in the Western world with the 13th Amendment, 1200 years after the Muslim world. It's better late than never. But wait, don't write angry comments right now. Wait until you understand the details first, then write whatever you want. Let's start with the Western world first. The 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution abolished slavery and involuntary servitude except as a punishment for a crime. Which is amazing. But the problem is, this amendment didn't fix two issues. Racism and private property. Let's discuss it one by one. Racism was running in the blood of the white man. Even if you force him to give up his slaves, he will never look at them as equals. And this is exactly what happened. For years and years after the amendment, maybe 100 years, black people were not treated as normal human beings. They didn't have the right to sit on white people's seats in buses. The 10 front seats were reserved for white people all the time. Movie theaters had separate entrances for black people and white people. Black children couldn't attend in the same schools as white children. Can you imagine how bad it was? That is because the amendment was forcing people to do the right thing without fixing what is in their hearts first. And if you think it is completely fixed now, you might be wrong. There are still some issues. For example, as of November 2022, Nobel Prizes has been awarded to 954 individuals, of whom 17 were black. This is only 1.7% of the 954 recipients. If you want to read more about this, I recommend this book, Sick of Freedom by historian Jim Downs. It's talking about how 25% of the slaves that were freed died in the first year of their freedom. Anyway, on the other side of the world, I grew up in the Middle East. In my school classroom, we had all people of all color, black, white, brown, everything. And we had no issue whatsoever to use words that others think are offensive, while actually it isn't. I called my black friends black, as in black chocolate. I called my white friends white, as in white chocolate. We never had any issues, until we grew up and started watching American movies. We noticed that they think that the word black is offensive for some reason. I didn't know why. I remember I started asking around. Why do they think that this word is offensive? That's very weird. I didn't understand because we actually lived in harmony for more than a thousand years. What they were going through is ancient history to us. And when Obama became president, they were saying all over the news, yay, we have a black president. I was like, what's the big deal? Why is that news? What are you proud of? I don't understand. And I started asking my friends, did we have a black president before? One of them said, I don't know. The other said, I think our last president was black, I'm not sure. Let me check. So we googled his picture and turns out he was black. No one noticed. No one cared. This is the difference between forcing racist people to do the right thing and between actually fixing the diseases in their hearts first and then telling them to do the right thing. The second issue with the amendment was private property. If you are living in a society where slavery is legal and you have a farmland and you need workers, the legal way to get workers is to buy them. So you did the right thing from your perspective. You took a loan and you bought 100 slaves with this loan money to work on your farm. Now you are in huge debt and the only way you can pay back your loan is by those 100 slaves to actually work and produce so you can earn and pay back your debt. And in this specific day, the government changes the constitution and force you to give up all the 100 slaves that you bought with debt. At this moment, you ask a fair question. What about my money? Will I get any reimbursement? I need to pay back my debt? And the response you get is a cricket sound. They didn't think about that. In this scenario, are you expecting him to give them up without a fight? Or are you expecting a civil war? And this was exactly what happened. More than half a million died and more than half a million were severely injured. 
I don't want to go into more details because it will turn into a history lesson. But to sum up, the 13th Amendment is something that we're proud of. It gave a lot of people their lives back. But it could have been done in a much better way. Fix by force is not always a wise choice. Fixing the core issues first is much more effective and will not lead to a civil war or years and years of suffering and racism. And as we have seen in the recent unfortunate events in Ukraine, racism is still flowing in the blood of the white man. Not all of them, of course, but more than enough to cause unnecessary mass hatred and enmity. These are not refugees from Syria. These are Christians, they're white, they're, um, they're very similar. Very similar to us. How so? Because the Syrian refugees are Muslims. Their skin is darker, their hair is not blonde. So Europe does not want them. And remember, this is not being said at some white supremacy cult. This is happening on live television. If you want more details about that, check our video debunking the Islamophobia terrorism claim forever. I will leave a link to it in the description below. Anyway, now we have all the context we need to actually understand how did the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, abolish slavery in the most brilliant way ever. Think of slavery as a river. In order to dry up a river, you need to do two things. First of all, you need to cut the sources that are pouring water in the river. Second of all, you need to create ways for the water to get out and leave it a little bit and it will dry itself. The Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, abolished slavery in five brilliant steps. Number one, stop racism and hatred. Number two, cut the sources of slavery. Number three, create exits for the current slaves. Number four, change the meaning of the word slave itself. And number five, make slavery uneconomical and unappealing. Let's discuss them step by step. Step number one, stop racism and hatred. The Prophet peace and blessing be upon him heard one of the disciples calling a black man, you are a son of a black woman. The Prophet immediately condemned this action and told him you still have the same ignorance of the Arabs before Islam. The Prophet peace and blessing be upon him said, he is not one of the Muslims, the one who spread racism or tribalism. He is not one of the Muslims, the one who fight for racism or tribalism. He is not one of the Muslims, the one who dies for racism or tribalism. The Prophet peace and blessing be upon him said, there is no superiority for an Arab over a non-Arab, for a non-Arab over an Arab, for a white man over a black man, for a black man over a white man. Everyone is equal except with righteousness. God said in the Quran chapter 49 verse 13, humanity, indeed, we created you from male and female and made you into peoples and tribes so you may get to know each other. Surely, the most noble of you in the sight of Allah is the most righteous among you. Allah is truly all-knowing, all-aware. So the only way we can differentiate between one man and another is righteousness. Not his tribe, not his family, not his wealth, and not his race. The Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, one time saw two people fighting for their tribes. Which tribe is more honorable? Exactly like now, which nationality or country is more honorable? Some think that if he was born in a specific country, that makes him somehow better than someone else who was born in another country. The Prophet responded to that saying, You are still in ignorance. Leave the ignorance, it is rotten. The sin of thinking that your brother is lower than you is enough to ruin your hereafter. The Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, said, He will not enter paradise, the one who has an atom's weight of arrogance in his heart. One atom. And arrogance is thinking that you are superior to someone else because of your family, race, wealth, nationality, whatever. Quran chapter 49 verse 10. From now on, believers are all brothers. And done. Racism is over in Arabia. And that was a huge achievement that happened in just a couple of years. While happened in other societies after more than 100 years of suffering. God said in Quran chapter 8 verse 63, He brought their hearts together. Had you spent all the riches on earth, you could not have united their hearts, but Allah has united them. Indeed, He is almighty, all wise. Step number two. Cut the sources of slavery. 
Remember the huge river of slavery? If you cut most of its sources, it will eventually dry up. People were becoming slaves in a lot of different ways. The Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, closed six of them completely and restricted one. Let's see. Number one, it was allowed for a man in debt to give himself up as a slave to pay his debt. The Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, forbade that. It's not allowed anymore. Number two, it was common for a poor person to sell one or two of his children as slaves to get money to spend it on the rest of his children. Let's say he has ten children, he will sell two as slaves and pay for the expenses of eight. The Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, forbade that. That is not allowed anymore. Number three, slavery was a punishment for some crimes. One of them was theft. If someone was caught stealing, they turned him into a slave as a punishment. The Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, forbade that. It's not allowed anymore. Number four, it was normal for Arab tribes to abduct travelers and turn them into slaves. But the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, forbade that. It's not allowed anymore. Number five, it was normal for Arab tribes to invade weaker tribes and steal their wealth and turn them into slaves. That was actually very common. But the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, forbade that. It's not allowed anymore. Number six, if one of the parents of the child was a slave, the child automatically became a slave. And the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, forbade that. The newborn child becomes automatically free. Number seven, the captives of war. All the captives of war were automatically slaves. The Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, didn't forbid that completely. Because if the enemy is taking our brothers as slaves, it is only fair that we do the same to them. So at least after the war, we can treat our brothers for their slaves. It is described in the Quran in chapter 47 verse 4. When you are in battle, be courageous, strike their necks, and take captives. But after the war is over, you have two choices. You can either release the captives as a favor for free, or you can ask for ransom. What happens if the Muslims decide not to free the captives as a favor, and the other country didn't pay the ransom for the captives? Here they become slaves. And this is the only source of slavery that the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him didn't close completely. Some people might say, this is inhumane. You should not enslave the enemy soldiers who were about to kill you. You should be nice to them. Usually you hear these statements coming from the same people who invaded other countries claiming they have weapons of mass destruction while they didn't. And then they killed 20% of the innocent population. 20% died for no reason whatsoever. They took war captives and they did this to them. And this, they played with them as if they were sex dolls or animals. After all that, they teach us moral lessons about human rights. If you want to read more about that, just Google torture at Abu Ghraib prison. Anyway, we don't put war captives in jail. We don't torture them. We don't sexually abuse them. That's not us. Okay? We distribute them on Muslim family. Every Muslim family takes one prisoner. Instead of putting him in jail, they put him in their house. He eats and sleeps with them and works them in their farmland, workshop, company, whatever. This is much more humane than the punishment of prison. And yes, enemy soldiers who were trying to kill us and invade our country, they deserve some kind of punishment. So this is the most humane punishment that anyone has ever done in history. Step number three, create exits for the slaves. After the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, decreased the sources of slavery by almost 90%, he started creating exits for the people who were already enslaved before. For example, according to the Quran, chapter 24, verse 33, if a slave asks for his freedom, he gets it immediately. But of course, he has to pay his ransom, right? What if he can't pay his ransom? What if he doesn't have money? Easy, he can write down a contract with his owner to pay his price later. For example, Let's say I bought a slave for $2,000. This slave woke up today and decided to be free. He goes to his master and tell him, I want to be free now, but I don't have the money. So, write a contract with me. Instead of paying you $2,000 now, no, I will go, be free, find a job, get salary, and pay you 
$200 per month for 10 months. In this case, it is a command from God that the owner must agree he can't say no. And also, he must give him a discount. God commanded the owner to give him a discount minimum 25-30% to 30% based on your generosity. This is how easy it is for someone to gain his freedom according to Sharia law. Another example. After the disbelievers of Mecca failed to kill the Muslims in the Battle of Badr, the Muslims took a lot of them as war captives. The Prophet offered those war captives a price for their freedom. He told them, if any one of you teaches 10 of our children how to read and write, he will be free immediately. As simple as that. Another example. After the Battle of Bani al-Mustaliq, Almost all of the tribe of Bani al-Mustaliq were taken as captives of war, and then they turned into slaves. The Prophet peace and blessing be upon him wanted to free them, but he can't just go to the Muslims and tell them, free the slave. This is private property. The Muslim might respond and say, that's unfair. I fought and I need at least ransom money. If you want to free him, I want my money. And it's his right. So the Prophet took a very clever step. He went to the leader of this tribe and asked him, Can I marry your daughter? And the leader said, Yes. Then he went to ask the daughter, Do you want to marry Prophet Muhammad? And she said yes. So they got married. The next day, the Prophet went back to the Muslims and told them, Why are you holding my family captives? All of these captives are my family now. I got married to the daughter of their leader. So what happened is, all of these slaves were freed for free, without any ransom. Commenting on that event, Mother Aisha said, I have never in my life seen a marriage of a girl that is more beneficial for her family than this marriage. Her marriage was the reason that all her tribe members got their freedom for free. Another example, Quran chapter 4 verse 92, the expiation for accidental death is freeing a slave. Expiation is the price you pay to remove a sin from your record. Another example, Quran chapter 5 verse 89, the expiation for false oath is freeing a slave. So every time someone says, I swear to God I will do this tomorrow, and then he doesn't, he has to free a slave. Another example, Quran chapter 90 verse 13, the beginning of the path of goodness is freeing a slave. Another example, Quran chapter 58 verse 3. If you fight with your wife and in the middle of the fight you tell her, I will never touch you in my life. The expiation for this sin is freeing a slave. Another example, according to this hadith, the expiation of having physical relationship with your wife while fasting in Ramadan is freeing a slave. Another example, according to this hadith, if any Muslim frees a slave, God will free him from hellfire. Another example, according to Quran chapter 9 verse 60, every Muslim is obligated to pay charity once every year, minimum. And this charity goes to specific destinations. As you can see in the verse, one of those destinations is what? Freeing a slave. And that is obligation on every Muslim. Another example, if a slave woman got married to a free man, she is not to do work anymore. And if she becomes a mother, she cannot be bought or sold anymore. She becomes Ummu Walad, and the newborns are not slaves, they are born free. There are a lot more exits, but I don't want this video to be boring, so to sum up. The Prophet peace and blessing be upon him closed 90% of the sources of slavery, and he created hundreds of exits for the people who were already in them. Then he started step number 4, change the meaning of the word slave itself. The Prophet peace and blessing be upon him said, for those who still have slaves, don't call them slaves anymore. This word is done. From now on, call them with other titles. For example, say, my boy, my girl, and so on. After that, there were two words that became widespread in the society, Mamluk and Mawla. The word Mamluk means an employee that is not free to change his boss unless the new boss pays for him first. In other words, owned employee or owned servant and the word slave disappeared. And the other word that was spread in the society is Mawla, which refers to both ex-slave and ex-master, because most of the freed slaves actually loved their owners, and most of them were actually freed by their owners, 
Even after they got their freedom, they went back to their ex-owner and told him, Can we stay with you, like work for you in any way? So they stayed together. But now, they got this new title. The master became Mawla, and the servant also became Mawla. Both of them have the same title, because both of them are equal now. Then, the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, said, Your own servants are your brothers. Allah has put them under your authority. If someone has his brother under his authority, check these rules out. He should feed him from what he eats, and clothe him from what he wears, and not burden him with anything that will be too much for him. And if you burden him for something that is hard, then help him with it. Don't sit there on the chair and let him do hard labor for you. No, go work with him. So if you own a boy or a girl, basically, you have to treat them like you treat your own children. It is like the alternative of adoption. At the beginning of the Prophet's life, he had a slave. His name was Anas ibn Malik. One day, his birth father came to pay for him and free him and take him back to his family. But Anas ibn Malik himself said, I enjoy serving Muhammad so much. I love him more than I love my own family. I want to stay with him. He preferred being a slave in the Prophet's house more than being a free man in his family's house. Later, of course, the Prophet freed him. We all know the story. Anas ibn Malik, may Allah be pleased with him, once said, I served the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, for 10 years. He never told me one single bad word, not even of. The Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, used to ask him, Do you want anything? Do you need anything? Can I help you with anything? He's talking to his servant. Until one day Anas told him, Yes, I want something from you. The Prophet said what? He said, I want your intercession on the Day of Judgment. The Prophet responded, Then help me with a lot of sujood. He means prayer or prostration. One day the Prophet ordered Anas ibn Malik to go do a task. Anas came across some children in the street. They were playing. He got distracted, he ignored the command of the Prophet, and he started playing with the children. But he was unlucky, because the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, caught him. He looked at the Prophet, expecting rage and anger. But what happened is, he found the Prophet smiling at him and saying, Unais, Unais is like a nickname, like Little Anas. Unais, did you go where I commanded you? And then Anas said, Allah's Messenger, I am going and going. That's it. Anas further said, I served him for years. He never said to me about the thing which I have done. Why did you do it? And about the thing that I left, why didn't you do it? Can you imagine that? A man came to the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, and said, Messenger of Allah, how often shall I forgive my servant? He's referring, of course, to the owned servant. The messenger replied, Forgive him 70 times per day. By the way, the word 70 in classical Arabic is a way to exaggerate any amount. Like we say now, forgive him million times. They would say it in classical Arabic, forgive him 70 times, which is a lot. The Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, used to pray for his servant. He used to say, Allah increase his wealth. Allah increase his children. Allah bless everything you give him. Now, do you understand why all the servants didn't want to be freed? Because when they are owned, they have the same right as if they were the sons of their master. But when they become employees, they will have nothing of that. They just get salary. The title Mamluk itself was not even something to be ashamed of. For example, when Umar ibn al-Khattab, the king of the whole Muslim world, was talking about Bilal, the black slave that got freed by Abu Bakr. He said what? He said our master, Abu Bakr, Freed our master, Bilal. This is what you get when you fix what is in the hearts. May Allah be pleased with all of them. The Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, also prohibited hating own servants completely. Not even one hit. He said, whoever hits his servant one time, this servant becomes free immediately, without any ransom. Imagine one hit equal his freedom. Compare that to what we read in the Bible. The same meaning you can find it in this hadith. Feed them and close them from what you feed and close yourselves. And do not hate them and do not torture them. The Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, also legalized the marriage between owned servants and free people. There is no discrimination. And God said in the Quran, chapter 24, verse 33, 
that you cannot force your female owned servants to do adultery, obscenity, prostitution, all of that is not allowed anymore. Ali ibn Abi Talib said, the last words that the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him said on his deathbed were as follows, keep your prayers and fear Allah when you deal with your owned servants. Imagine, and that was the end of the word slave and its meaning. And the start of the new word Mamluk that has completely different fresh new meaning to it. Finally, step number five, make slavery uneconomical and unappealing. After all of these modifications to the definition of the word slave, after all of these rules that God and his prophet gave, having a slave now became exactly like adopting a child. He will not take your name, of course, but you will feed him like you feed yourself, dress him like you dress yourself, provide shelter and protection for him. You will be responsible for his life, and in return he will of course help you with your work. That is a lot of responsibility that a lot of people don't want. It is much easier to hire an employee and just give him his salary at the end of the month. You don't have to feed employees from what you eat, you don't have to provide for them the same living standard you provide for your own family. It became much easier to get an employee instead. For example, if right now, in 2023, I got a slave. If I have an iPhone, I have to buy him an iPhone too. If I have a laptop, I have to buy him a laptop. If I am eating steak, I have to feed him from the same steak. However, if I get an employee, I will just give him his salary and I don't care what he does in his life, not my problem. And this is why a lot of Muslim slaves in history, when they were offered an opportunity to be free, they refused. They decided to have the slave status. And this is why for hundreds of years, most countries in the Middle East were ruled by slaves. From the president, to ministers, to government officials, all slaves. If you want more insight, just google Dawlat al-Mamalik. Anyway, because most people didn't want to have slaves anymore, the price of slaves went down. No one wants to buy. And when the price of slaves went down, it became much easier to free them using the obligatory charity that every Muslim should do or by expiation of sins. And that was much, much better than the forceful way that the Western world took which led to civil war and years of suffering and racism. One more thing, the Islamic slavery system still exists right now, by the way, all over the world. It just has a different name. For example, football players, Cristiano Ronaldo, Messi, Mohamed Salah. If any one of them wants to move from one club to another, he doesn't apply his CV like a normal employee. No, the new club must buy him. And they will pay a lot of money if they want him to work for them. Right? This is the Islamic concept of slavery. The difference between that and an employee is the employee moves freely from one company to another while the Mamluk has to be bought by the other company. Another example. When production companies write exclusive contracts with some singers, this singer has to work for this specific production company for like 10 years. During this 10 years, he can't work for another company, right? Again, the same concept. An employee that is owned, he can't freely move to another company whenever he wants. This is a Mamluk. So the Islamic definition of slavery is something that the whole world is okay with. And the whole world is actually doing right now. No one thinks it's bad. It is completely different from the Western definition of the word slave. One word, but two completely different meanings. So next time when someone tells you, Muslims have no problem with slavery, just remember Messi. One last thing I want to finish this video with. I actually think, in my own opinion, that the Mamluk system is much better than the employment system. Hear me out. I run a software company in Dubai. In our business, we face an issue that a lot of businessmen and managers know about. I am sure they will relate. What happens is, we hire a software developer, for example. During his first year, he's very slow. He makes a lot of mistakes. But we see potential, so we decide to invest in him. We dedicate our company resources and train him. We purchase training courses for him. We also pay for his certification. And after one year of investment, he becomes extremely productive. Amazing employee. But the moment that happens, he decides to quit 
because he got a better offer from another company and we lose all our investment. What about the resources and time and money we invested in you? Nah, I quit. That doesn't happen in football clubs. When they take a young player and spend a lot of resources and time and money to train him to make him a football superstar, he can't just run away and go work for another club. The other club must pay a lot of money to take him from us. And this is a fair compensation to the investment that was made to this football player. And in my opinion, this is a much more fair option than the current employment system. In other words, in the past they had better systems than what we have now. Let me know what is your opinion about this point in the comments below. I will read and reply to all of your comments personally. Before we go, remember that the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him said, deliver my message even if as small as one verse. This video will 100% be shadow banned on YouTube. There is no way the algorithm will recommend it to anyone because of the controversial contents that it has. So don't let it stop with you. Share it with your friends. Help it spread by engaging with likes, engaging with comments. And if you want to watch our video, Debunking Islamophobia Terrorism Claim Forever, click here. And if you want to watch a complete breakdown on Sharia law, check out this playlist down there. Thanks and salam.